Hi. This lecture is intended to clarify some of the reading that you've done on the cognitive psychology of the emotions with particular reference to the SPARS model developed by Power and Dalgleish. So um, the SPARS model, first of all, is the schematic, propositional, analogical, and associative representational systems. So it's basically a model that talks about four different systems, if you will, that interact in various ways and through their interaction generate the experience of emotion. And it's a theory that brings together a lot of previous cognitive psychological work on, on emotions which is why I think it's a, a useful model for everybody to think about. So first of all, basic question, what is an emotion? You've already done quite a bit of reading about it, so you have a sense of the cognitive psychological take on what an emotion is. But <clears throat> prior to doing your reading, I'm sure that you had your own thoughts about what an emotion might be. So uh, these next slides here, I'm not going to go into too much detail about them, but essentially uh, what I invite you to do is reflect on various words that, whose meaning is similar to emotion. And you'll note that uh, these are all words you'll see on the next couple of slides, emotion, feeling, mood, disposition, Affect, you'll see on the other slide, a few other things. Um, they are actually words, for the most part, from popular parlance, uh, words that people use in everyday conversation to talk about these phenomena, the phenomena of, of emotions and moods, etc. That spectrum of human experience. And uh, psychology psychological science has appropriated those terms in some way and uh, tried to either through theory or through empirical work specify a more precise meaning of what those words um, might be. So, uh, so in other words, uh, you're talking with your mom or dad or kids about emotions you'll use that word in the lay sense. But when you are using the word emotion or feeling or any of these words in the context of psychological, scientific writing or discourse, conversations even, you have to be very careful because um, those words in this context, the scientific context, they have a particular uh, technical meaning. And if you are talking to other psychologists, particularly other cognitive psychologists, then um, you have to be really clear about your technical usage of the words. Now, that being said, um, you know, uh, different psychological scientists have appropriated, appropriated the same words to mean slightly different things. So, um, so emotion might mean one thing for one emotion researcher and another thing for another emotion researcher. So we know that for Ekman, emotions come in types. And uh, for the people who advocate the dimensional approach, they, they're, not type, they're not different types of emotions. So there's different specifications. Um, some researchers put the emphasis on a cognitive appraisal. Other researchers put the emphasis on the physiological response. So, um, you know, and, and actually, um, we haven't talked about the behaviorist uh, approach to emotion, but behaviorists would uh, talk about the behavior and emphasize that. So each researcher for reasons that that researcher thinks are good enough, each researcher uh, might have a slightly different definition of the word emotion. So again, Power and Dalgleish give a good summary, an overview of many of those different views. 
they don't go so much into, for example, psychoanalytic takes on what emotion is. But uh, aside from that, uh, they give a good overview. And still within uh, Power and Dog Leash, there's leeway. You'll see there's leeway. Sometimes emotions include all of the different possible elements and sometimes just some of them. And uh, the way that word emotion is defined uh, depends not only on the researcher, but also um, on basically what, what's going on in the moment, what, if there's a specific example that you're talking about. So I uh, hope that makes sense. Anyway, um, just before we get started on all the talk about theories related to emotion, I'd like to invite you to reflect on all of these different words that are in common parlance about uh, emotion. So um, we have the words like feeling and mood, disposition on the next slide. Um, you see affect, etc. cetera. And, and um, I just wanna highlight for you, um, basically these are all just for you to think about. Have a look at the slides and, um, and see what you think. What might the difference between uh, emotion and feeling, emotion and mood, emotion and disposition, um, mood versus disposition, mood versus affect. Uh, but what I do want to highlight for you now is are two important distinctions. So uh, we have here at the top of this slide emotion versus feeling. And I want to remind you about the Damasio video that uh, you watched, the, the talk that he gave, where he talks clearly about feeling being uh, basically everything that an emotion is plus the additional conscious awareness, conscious experience of the emotion. So in other words, for Damasio, you can have an emotion without having a feeling. You can have an emotion without feeling it, essentially. And uh, sorry, if you hear vacuum cleaners going or toilets flushing, etc. I'm at my sister's house. So it's sort of when there's kids around. So I have the door closed. Hopefully it's not too distracting. I just heard the toilet flush in the other room. But uh, it's not me flushing the toilet. I'm sitting at the desk here. Anyway, um, uh, and here on this second slide of these contrasts, I also want to highlight for you this difference between mood and affect. And that's particularly important. It's as important as the uh, emotion versus feeling uh, contrast. Here's mood versus affect. Um, that is uh, clinically important because uh, on the mental status exam, when you are asked to uh, describe your client's um, is emotional state, they break it down into mood, which is typically understood by psychiatric psychologists or within psychiatric psychology um, as uh, referring to the, uh, the uh, subjective self-report of the client. So in other words, the client would say, I've been feeling down lately. So you would write something like the client reports sad mood. And you would, of course, add, ask a follow-up question, how long has this been going on? And you'd say three weeks. And so you'd say client reports having had a sad mood for the last three weeks. But maybe when he tells that to you, he's uh, actually, um, maybe it's a relief for him to tell you this. And so maybe he actually seems... Uh, at peace, or maybe he really likes you, maybe you have a great relationship with him, and he's happy to see you. And so his affect is uh, more tranquil, more euthymic on the spot. So you would say that his affect, which in fact is understood within psychiatric psychology as being what you observe, his affect is incongruent with his reported mood. And that's not necessarily pathological in this example that I just gave, by the way, um, there's nothing pathological about that. On the other hand, somebody could say, you know, I've been, you know, uh, very depressed over the last three weeks reporting a um, sad mood, depressed mood. And, but when he's telling you this, he could be giddy with uh, almost manic enthusiasm, 
And uh, this would be another case of incongruent affect and mood, but in this case, uh, it would raise the, the, um, your suspicion, raise your eyebrow uh, somehow, because uh, it seems that there might be something pathological about the incongruence between the affect and the mood. Maybe um, the, the person might be psychotic. A uh, person might be, who knows, probably might be manic, uh, f could be full-on psychotic, um, could be doing some sort of strange malingering. We don't know. But anyway, so we look for congruence between mood and affect. But the idea is uh, within uh, psychiatric psychology that the word affect means um, what you observe uh, in the person that you're working with, whereas mood is what they report. And by the way, that sometimes boils down to um, affect being a, a momentary on the spot thing, whereas mood is uh, sort of how the person's been doing over a more extended period of time. That, if you think about it, it it'll make sense to you uh, because somebody says, let's say you're there as a client and your therapist asks you, uh, how have you been doing lately? And uh, you know, maybe everything's fine lately but um, you had a like really bad day. So um, you say like, you know, I've been doing fine lately, but you might be pissed off when you, when you said it. So the, so the therapist would observe, you know, maybe like a slightly more irritable affect, but as long as you have um, the ability to be um, honest and have integrity in your therapy session, then you would still be able to report having been uh, doing relatively well over the past few weeks. And so uh, your self-report in some cases will just naturally tend to be uh, make reference to a longer period of time. It's not always the case. Uh, the thing to remember is that mood is the self-reported um, uh, emotional state and affect is the clinician observed emotional state or observed by anybody, not just a clinician. But note, like I was saying earlier, uh, different researchers and different parts, different lines of uh, application or theory within psychology use these terms in just slightly different ways because what I just told you is what the definition of affect is within psychiatric psychology. But uh, in fact, uh, within, in, the, in Power and Dalgleish, uh, you know, they don't talk much about affect at all. And the little that they do um, seems like it might they might be using it to mean something similar to Damasio's feelings, so something similar to uh, an experienced, consciously experienced emotional state. So, um, so just to be aware that uh, there are differences in terms of um, of uh, you know how these terms are used, and when you go to do your own writing about emotions, affects, moods, all these things, just be very clear. And, um, you know, I, I counsel you again to, uh, when in doubt, add a sentence, a brief sentence, saying exactly what you mean by this technical term. Uh, not only, uh, I mean, particularly when you do writing for a class like this, because I want to know that you know what you're talking about. And sometimes if you write in a way that's ambiguous, I won't I won't have enough to go on. Um, but, uh, you know, and less so when you do regular professional writing, but sometimes even in regular professional clinical writing, it's still useful to specify what you mean by the technical term. So anyway, in all of this, um, I basically just invited you to reflect on uh, technical differences in uh, technical usages of words, and uh, and I haven't given you any thing concrete to go on, so I'm gonna now uh, turn to Power and Dalgleish, providing a diagram here. Um, this is from Chapter Five, and uh, somebody's vacuuming outside, so I hope this doesn't detract from the video at all. But um, but uh, have a look at this, because this, these are the components of an emotional state. Um, summarized in Chapter 5, originally presented in Chapter 2. So where is the emotion? 
in this? Where would you, if you had to draw a circle around the emotion, where would you draw the circle? So you can just reflect on this. Um, different people might draw the circle around different elements. Um, here you can certainly see that it would be hard to draw a circle without including in the circle the appraisal. So that seems to be um, a very central. The appraisal, physiological reactivity, and action potential seem to be uh, central parts of it, whereas the event and the behavior on either end, they seem to be less central. But uh, remember that if you are, if your approach is like an activity theorist approach, you might actually include the event and the behavior as part of the emotional experience because remember that uh, for activity theory, theorists, no cognitive event, and by extension, no cognitive or affective event, no psychological event, can be uh, understood in isolation. So you'd have to include all of the life events, contextual circumstances, etc., as well as the behavioral products. So it depends on what you like, essentially, um, where you draw that circle. But you know the recommendation in Power and Dog Leash is that uh, the the appraisal you can see on this uh, chain the appraisal is uh, needs to be included because it's the only way. Uh, they say uh, to clearly differentiate between emotions and you can think of an easy example of this by uh, for example thinking about um, you know uh, you get um, say like uh, you know maybe there's a like um, somebody apologizes to another person but two people apologize uh, to, to somebody else. And uh, so the behavior is the same, but uh, you know maybe one is doing it to reduce their own guilt, whereas the other is doing it because of genuine emotional resonance with the suffering uh, of the other person. So behavior certainly isn't uh, a way to tell the difference between uh, emotions. Physiological response. Um, you know, uh, for example, me, I tend to be sort of high strung sometimes. So, uh, so if something freaks me out, I get very, very, uh, physiologically activated. And actually, even when it's just a little thing, I can still get sort of physiologically activated. I can still get like a, a little bit of that tachycardia and shortness of breath and this sort of thing. I'm working on it, you know, but so, um, you know, I might, have uh, you know low level sympathetic activation uh, in response to just a, a low level emotion, whereas the next person over might uh, only get that phys might get that physical response for a much uh, more intense version of the same emotion. So I um, because there are differences from individual to individual in terms of how phys physiologically responsive we are to emotions, we also can't differentiate one emotion from the other on the basis of physiological response. Action readiness, obviously that's sort of covered by behavior, and obviously conscious awareness is no uh, way to tell emotions uh, the one from the other because we might not even have conscious awareness. We know that from Damasio and also from Power and Dog Leash. So, um, so that's why in this model, uh, the appraisal is central. And appraisal is central even when uh, emotion is generated through the associative uh, pathway, by the way, as you'll see later. So, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, what is an emotion? It is uh, at least an appraisal, a physiological response, and an action readiness. And then there are a couple other options, add-ons. You know, you might add, have these various add-ons, like plugins or whatever, if you like. Um, and yet, so we can say that the um, emotion is a complex chain of events, uh, an appraisal, a response, an action readiness. And, and again, you can differ like which you think comes first, the response first, the appraisal first, etc. You'll see there's been theoretical debate. You're already aware of that, actually. But um, the, uh, a complex chain of events triggered by certain stimuli so that means that um, there's causality within this, and it's also sequential in some way. Something, something happens first, like an emotionally competent event, which is uh, Damasio's term. An emotionally competent event happens, and then it is experienced, it's perceived, 
Um, and then a, a chain reaction essentially is started and there's recursiveness within the chain reaction so that uh, later events in the chain can actually go back and, and modify earlier processes so that as the, um, the, uh, as time passes, essentially the emotion might change, it might escalate, it might reduce itself, that sort of thing. So, but nonetheless, uh, even though emotion is a complex chain of heterogeneous uh, mental phenomena, it is nonetheless experienced as a whole, a whole thing. People experience sadness and it feels like an emergent whole. So um, that's just something to keep in mind that uh, in some ways, as we're going to be talking about, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So, um, you know, one one example is, um, you know, that, that uh, the appraisal, if you think that the appraisal leads to a physiological response and action readiness, um, and then that whole conglomerate of uh, heterogeneous uh, experiences, appraisal, response, and readiness, uh, that that is then experienced as a whole, then as a whole, it can later influence subsequent appraisals. So if you start to get, in other words, if something bad happens, so you, a goal is lost and you get sad and you have the, the physiological response of uh, deactivation and action readiness with, to withdraw, this sort of thing, um, then that in aggregate can bias the system overall. There's a like a sadness module going so that subsequent appraisals are biased uh, in a sadness word direction. So and in that sense the the emotion functions as a whole. Now uh, that's sort of a foretaste of what's going to come but um, but uh, back to what is an emotion. Just a couple slides here on uh, categorical versus dimensional approaches to emotion. And um, I think we've talked already about categorical versus dimensional distinctions between phenomena. And a categorical approach uh, to understanding the phenomena in the natural world would be an approach that says that the phenomena under consideration differ each one from the others qualitatively, qualitatively rather than quantitatively. So they differ by type rather than differ by degree. That means uh, a categorical approach is a sort of apples and oranges approach. Uh, whereas a dimensional uh, approach would be the, um, you know, the idea that, um, you know, there's no such thing as tall people or short people because there's no group of tall people, group of short people, because there's all these people in the middle and it doesn't make sense to um, say that some people are tall or some people sh are short because it would be arbitrary in a way. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So anyway, back to the apples and oranges approach, categorical approach. This primarily comes from the work of Paul Ackman and people who followed him. But uh, basically, he did uh, work on facial expressions, emotionally relevant facial expressions, and uh, did a lot of huge, actually, cross-cultural studies and in various different countries and found uh, pretty much universally that there are just a handful of basic emotional types each one with its own discernible, identifiable facial expression that differs by type from the facial expressions pertaining to the other emotions in that handful of basic emotions. So um, Ekman's six uh, were original six were happiness, surprise, anger, sadness, fear, and disgust. You'll note that uh, in Power and Dog Leash, which adopt the categorical approach as well, surprise is not present. So um, that should illustrate for you an ongoing principle of the course, which is that there's never a perfect agreement. 
So, uh, so, you know, you can think about the categorical approach to emotions as pointing towards, you know, say between five and seven types of base, basic emotions, each one with their own facial expression. And there's a good deal of empirical research backing that up. And if you want to subdivide the uh, emotions further, then you'd find, you know, you could find 25, 30, et cetera, different types within, if you look at subtypes. But just looking at the basic types, uh, say five to seven. So uh, this work has been going on for the last 40 years. It's very convincing. Um, but there's not perfect agreement even among the researchers that share this view. Now, uh, contrastingly, we have the dimensional approach to emotion. And uh, in this, again, it's sort of like um, the idea that uh, different from the categorical approach to emotion, it's the idea that uh, you could construct a two or more dimensional space with two or more different axes, each axis pertaining to a particular variable that is necessary to specify any particular instance of an emotional experience. So uh, the simplest type of dimensional approach, well, the simplest type would be a one-dimensional approach, like, uh, say, just pleasure to misery. And, uh, you know, you might have... Uh, might say if you believed in a one-dimensional approach to emotion you could say that every emotion could be specified on a single dimension going from infinitely pleasurable to infinitely miserable going through a zero point which would be equally pleasurable or miserable or maybe uh yeah something like this so um, that would get you into problems though because uh, somebody could say well uh, say I'm equally afraid and angry or so one person is a, say there are two experiences fear a level 10 fear and a level 10 anger would show up as level 10 misery and, and there would be no way in that one dimensional model of emotion to differentiate between fear and anger so uh, that doesn't really make very much sense that's how it works but that doesn't make very much sense so you need a more complicated dimensional model than just a simple one-dimensional model. So the next simplest would be, of course, a two-dimensional model. You can just think of it as an X and a Y axis. Actually, the next slide shows that, so I'm just previewing it for you. But um, you might have uh, what uh, a, pr a prominent example of a two-dimensional model of emotion is valence versus arousal. So valence would be that pleasure to misery on how subjectively aversive the emotional experience is. And arousal could be maybe, if that's the x-axis, then arousal could be the y-axis. And it could be basically a measure of how activated the emotional experience is. So now it's starting to bring in that physiological response portion. So you could think of, uh, you know, the arousal dimension as being going from infinitely aroused or as aroused as humanly possible, as activated as humanly possible, to as somnolent, as uh, deactivated as humanly possible, which might be sleep. So just thinking about it, <clears throat> I'm going to advance the next slide, but just thinking about it, so look at that arousal to sleep uh, dimension. If, uh, and say it goes from like plus 10 to negative 10, with negative 10 being sleep. So zero would be right there in the middle. And say you're uh, a five, say, you know, say I, at first I'm a five on arousal and, um, and then I go to a six because things are getting ratcheted up a little bit. But then if I'm, comparing that experience at five and at six with each other, I would always be able to uh, find a midpoint in between them. I could be five and a half. And then between five and a half and five, I could refine it to 5.25. And between five and 2.5, sorry, 5.25, excuse me, between 5.25 and five, 
I could specify it further to 5.125. And between 5.125 and 5, I could find 5.07, right? Some, something in the middle. I could keep finding midpoints. And so, um, you know, if I was going to say something like, uh, um, for example, you know, for example, if uh, fear and sadness are both on the misery side of the model, but fear is, um, because it involves anxiety, it's uh, more highly aroused, whereas uh, sadness is, uh, around, is, is a lower level of arousal, then I would uh, say you could probably, maybe there's a way of going from fear to sadness by simply decreasing your level of arousal. And along that trajectory, I would always be able to find a midpoint between any two points uh, on that trajectory. And this is different from uh, a qualitative distinction between fear and sadness. So in the uh, Ekman up here, in the Ekman et al. Uh, approach, which indicates qualitative distinctions between emotions, you wouldn't be able to simply um, find a midpoint between uh, fear and sadness. It wouldn't make sense because there is something qualitatively distinct about each of those two emotions. Whereas in the uh, two-dimensional, or in any, actually, any dimensional model of emotion, you uh, would always be able to gradually increase some variable that pertains to that emotional experience. And uh, by, by modifying it gradually, eventually get to the point where it's, uh, um, you know, a, a, a quite a different emotional experience, but that even very, very different emotional experiences, experiences that are experienced subjectively as being very different from each other are somehow connected along a gradient. So uh, those are the two primary approaches to emotion. And uh, again, we're using the Power and Dalgleish text, so we're going with the qualitative distinctions. But there is some talk in Power and Dalgleish of the dimensional model. So I would say Let's go with the qualitative model, but keep in mind that um, it doesn't have perfect explanatory power because, um, you know, it has certainly been criticized for uh, oversimplifying the differences between emotions. And so, for example, if we imagined a multidimensional space with many, many dimensions, maybe 20 different dimensions, not just two, and uh, each emotional experience, every emotional experience imaginable could be characterized by those 20 variables, pleasure to misery and uh, 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 activated to deactivated and, you know, whatever it is. Maybe we wouldn't even have words in the English language for uh, all of those 20 different variables and each variable would be a dimension. Uh, just, uh, describing the uh, multidimensional space and then you would choose a point in that multidimensional space that would perfectly describe the uh, emotional experience under consideration. That uh, the, the dimensional theorists, they say that this gives a lot more uh, flexibility and refinement to science's ability to describe emotional experience compared to a uh, categorical approach, which they see as glossing over important fine-tuning sorts of distinctions. Now, uh, hopefully you're thoroughly confused by that, thinking once again that this class doesn't tell you anything is the way anything is. So uh, that's good because uh, Again, to reiterate to you, my uh, ulterior motive is to show you um, that all of science involves models, and every model is uh, simply an utterance, and every utterance is both exuberant and deficient. It conveys more 
than uh, we, we want for it to convey, and it also fails to convey many of the things that we hoped that it would convey. So every model is both exuberant and deficient. So both of these are wrong, but both are useful in a certain way as well. Anyhow, uh, speaking of usefulness, why do we even have emotions? So um, generally, uh, the way I like to think about things is that uh, whether you're into full-on natural selection based on random occurrences of genetic mutations and environmental constraints, or whether you're into intelligent design, either way, um, we must have emotions for some reason. They have to be useful in some way. If we didn't need them, then why would we have them? So, uh, so what is the point of emotions? Why are they useful? Uh, um, and from a cognitive psychological perspective, uh, if you, you can sort of pair this question down and answer it in a very concrete way that emotions usually help us with certain kinds of decision making. So here are some examples. Um, you know, fear leads to uh, selective attention to threat and might cause that action readiness, uh, which would be readiness to either fight or uh, fly away. Uh, flee, excuse me, flee, not fly, fly, to, me, maybe, um, to either fight or flee. And uh, so you can see that fear by doing this under normal circumstances would help avoid, help in any organism avoid dangerous, situa dangerous situations and lower, in general, across the population, lower the accidental death rate, this sort of thing. And uh, likewise, sadness uh, increases focus on accurate analysis uh, of problems and um, I've misspelled the word strategic but um, you know might help people know when to withdraw sometimes this getting a solution to our problems requ um, requires withdrawing or submitting a little bit submitting to authority or uh, accepting some difficult uh, thing that has occurred and so um, in this way, sadness can actually, you know, might lead to an increase in social support um, and particularly uh, uh, improve the extent to which an individual would be able to find an adaptive place within a hierarchy. So these are times when emotions are helpful. And actually, that's most of the time. Most of the time, emotions can be helpful. Uh, and as we'll see, so that's like the, the ordered version of emotion, the emotion that reflects what's really going on in the environment and um, leads to flexible changes in cognitive acts. Now, um, let's talk about some of the earliest psychological theories of emotion. The first major theory was the James Lange theory. And it's probably actually pronounced Langa, I guess. I, I've never looked that up, but he was Danish, Carl Langa. But in any event, William James, my hero, personal hero, uh, and Carl Langa, who I have no idea who he is, except for I know that he had the same theory as William James, um, uh, both developed the same idea independently of each other. That's why it's called the James, let's call it the James Langa theory. Uh, in the mid-1880s, end of the uh, 19th century. And uh, so they talked about three successive stages in emotion genera generation, uh, an emotionally competent stimulus and event. Um, and uh, I'm using Damasio's term there. They didn't call it an emotionally competent stimulus, but it's a nice term. You could use it. So there's an event like a car coming to rapidly towards you as you cross the road. And then uh, the next thing that happens is a physiological change, or more than one, maybe. So arousal in the uh, autonomic nervous system. And uh, then there is potentially a subjective interpretation of the bodily changes, which leads to the experience of emotion, which uh, would be akin to Damasio's consciously experienced feeling. So you can see that uh, here visually. <laughs> 
there's the perception of the event there's the event actually and then there's it, the perception of the event and then there is the bodily changes and note here that uh and particularly for james talking about these earlier theories james included the running away i think on this other slide uh it's just mentions physiological changes but in fact for james uh the bodily changes in, involved behavior too so you 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 see the bear coming and then you find yourself running away with your heart beating and being short of breath and then you interpret all of those bodily and behavioral changes uh, in some way and that interpretation is what causes what constitutes in fact the experience of the emotion so this is you can think of this as the like precursor to a cognitive appraisal model there's an, there's a there's an interpretation going on but really it's more like event and uh, uh, physiological change plus behavior so uh, 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 later, um, quite a bit later, in 1962, a uh, variant of this is the Schachter and Singer theory. Uh, and uh, this is actually an interesting experiment. I'm not going to go over it right now. Um, for example, uh, you, you ought to know it for the E triple P, that sort of thing. But um, what they came out with was that two factors are essential for emotions to be experienced. You need uh, some change in physiological arousal. I would actually not necessarily call it high physiological arousal because sometimes it can be low. I'm going to I'm going to have to edit that slide later. It um it could be a change in physiological arousal and then um, an emotional interpretation of the change in that arousal. And so uh no emotion will be experienced if either is missing. So um Actually, to tell you the truth, when Schachter and Singer did it, they were really only talking about high arousal because um, they gave adrenaline shots, I think, actually, and induced emotions. But uh, for our purposes, uh, you can clearly see how this idea would extend to low, abnormally low levels of physiological arousal as well. Now... Um, Moving on to the 80s and 90s, um, we get into the earliest appraisal theories. So um, this is where psychology starts to come out really clearly and start to say that emotional experience really depends on cognitive appraisal, the interpretation of the current situation. It's not just any interpretation, but a particular type of interpretation. And what type of interpretation is it? Uh, you can think about this Lazarus's view of cognitive appraisal as being uh, subdivided into three types. There's primary appraisal, secondary appraisal, and reappraisal. So the first one, primary appraisal, is um, whether it is uh, a positive event in relationship to your well-being, uh, irrelevant to your well-being, or stressful because it impedes your well-being in some way. And... Um, then the secondary appraisal is that that same situation that you just did the primary appraisal on, you do another appraisal, which is uh, you take stock of the whole thing in light of um, your, your interpretation of your own coping resources that are relevant to help you deal with this uh, situation. And then there's a reappraisal, a reappraisal because time is going by, right? So the situation is changing and you're taking action, etc. And so the stimulus situation and coping strategies continue to be modified. And, uh, and then this changes your primary and secondary appraisals on an ongoing basis. So not, it's not, never just a snapshot it's always uh, an ongoing thing now uh, a refinement of this you see here also from Lazarus Smith and Lazarus in the early 90s um, subdivided those three types of appraisal into actually six components each one has uh, two parts to it so the primary appraisal has motivational relevance and motivational congru congruence Secondary appraisal is divided into accountability and problem-focused uh, coping potential. So, excuse me, I'm misspeaking. Um, actually, the secondary is divided into into four parts. So, uh, the primary appraisal. Let's go. Let's let me back up so I don't confuse you guys more than I already did. But uh, essentially. Um, this distinction between motivational relevance and motivational congruence 
still falls within the primary appraisal because it has to do with um, how, you know, have I committed myself? Have I, um, how relevant uh, is this situation? Uh, for me, and and if it's highly relevant, then I, um, you know, I'm more motivated uh, by this experience. So the experience will be more motivating for me. And um, how tied in with it, to, how tied in to my personal goals is this uh, experience that I'm passing through? Um, is it congruent or incongruent? And um, so the more relevant and congruent uh, you appraise the present situation to be, the more motivating it will be for you. So uh, the secondary appraisals divided into four subtypes, focusing on accountability, problem-focused coping potential, emotion-focused coping potential, and future expectancy is also important. So um, you're going to see later that some types of emotion are focused on a particular person. So there's this uh, appraisal of who deserves the credit or blame for the situation that you're in. So for example, um, it's hard to be angry if, um, without having somebody to blame. Even if you, you know, a lot of times people blame God or blame the universe or blame themselves or blame another person, maybe scapegoating another person. So there's a secondary appraisal, which can be valid or invalid or whatever. It just happens to be, you know, it, whether it's valid or invalid, it's important. So I might think that, you know, I'm the one to blame for a particular situation um, when really, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe uh, it just was the way things worked out. Um, but so I do a secondary appraisal that, uh, you know, involves a determination of who's accountable. And then these two types of coping, problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping, um, have to do with uh, the problem-focused coping is resolving the situation. And uh, emotion-focused coping is uh, handling it psychologically. So in other words, if the situation can't be resolved, how can I uh, stay balanced psychologically? Can I... Do I need to uh, avoid thinking about it or do I need to sublimate something or do I, you know, what, what is it? Um, and so this, a lot of defenses actually come in here, psychological defenses. And then that uh, last type of secondary appraisal or component of secondary appraisal, I guess, is uh, future expectancy. How likely is it that the situation will change? And that refers also to, you know, if you do, if you're going to do problem focused po coping, then how likely is it that your problem focused coping will be effective? But it doesn't only have to do with problem focused coping because maybe the situation itself is malleable or temporary. If, if the situation is uh, seen as permanent, uh, then uh, it might motivate you in a, in a different way. If the situation is seen as, as permanent, and um, not malleable in response to problem-focused coping, then uh, it might be actually very disheartening for you. But if the situation is permanent, um, but with a good chance that your problem-focused coping might actually resolve it completely, permanent if you do nothing, but uh, responsive to problem-focused coping, then that actually might be very invigorating for you. So you can see how these appraisals work together to determine how a person experiences uh, a particular emotion, so or a particular uh, situation. So this appraisal theory was developed in the context of Lazarus's view of coping, um, and it's the way situations are appraised in relationship to uh, the view of self, world, and other, and uh, personal goals. So um, again, the uh, different emotional states can be distinguished on the basis of the appraisal components. Now, uh, these earlier appraisal theories didn't say much about the actual processes involved in appraisal. You can see if you look back here, it just sort of says what the appraisal is targeting. But uh, it doesn't say 
uh, how that's happening cognitively, the process. Remember that, um, so in other words, here, uh, it's sort of talking about uh, content, in other words. It might be more akin to uh, representation within Nicer's cognitive architecture, whereas here, it's talking about process. So uh, these later theories, for example, Smith and Kirby, 2001, started to distinguish between two different types of appraisal processes. A, re a more reasoned process, they called reasoning, uh, versus a more automatic process, which they call associative processing. You can see this harks to uh, back to um, what's it called to uh, Kahneman's System One and System Two, right? So System One would be the associative processing, and System Two would be the reasoning. And again, the reasoning, just like System Two, it takes more time. It requires attentional resources. It's more deliberate. It is not automatic. It is controlled. Whereas that associative processing occurs quickly. Uh, rapidly, automatically, and it's sort of uh, and and uh, without a lot of uh, personal control because it just activates all relevant information in long-term memory, even information that might not be particularly adaptive for uh, for you to be um, for for it to be activated. For example, in the case of PTSD, um, it's that associative processing that causes the um, highly stressed out reaction to become salient even when um, it's just, you know, a car alarm going off in the road. It's not, um, you know, an air raid warning. So uh, then there is, uh, you know, another function within this Smith and Kirby theory where there are appraisal detectors that uh, monitor information about the type of appraisal that's going on from both the reasoning and the associative processes and feed that information about the appraisal back into the overall information processing system and uh, and then that appraisal information is what determines the emotional experience and so this fits very nice nicely actually with the power and Dalgleish perspective that um, <clears throat> that um, the central uh, element of the emotion is the cognitive appraisal and that is through examining the cognitive appraisal that we can determine one emotion from another and so this is actually giving us a model for how that might actually work from the inside out. And this one, um, other, okay, so other problems with early appraisal theories. Uh, so the, up here on this slide, uh, it's pointed out that um, until recently, there hasn't been much of a focus on the actual cognitive processes. And then further problems with the earlier appraisal theories is that they may simplify this appraisal and experience of emotion. Um, uh, you know, the idea that there's only uh, three types of appraisal um, that can be basically divided into six components, two components of primary appraisal and four components of secondary appraisal, plus this idea that there's a reappraisal going on uh, continuously. Uh, that, that, that that actually might simplify appraisal. Um, there might not be, um, there might be finer distinctions uh, between uh, types of appraisal. Maybe appraisals don't differ one from the other by type, uh, it, just in the way that emotions uh, themselves might not differ the one from the other by type. So this is the same type of criticism uh, here levied against the appraisal theories of emotion generation. Um, but it's the same type of criticism that we saw earlier, just a few slides up, on um, you know the the um, the people who like the dimensional approaches to emotion, the types of criticisms that they were levying against the categorical approaches to emotion, essentially saying that um, those theories oversimplify processes that are much uh, more variegated. And uh, obviously, we haven't seen anything yet about uh, social context or cultural context. And, um, and in fact, we've seen, you know, Ekman's claim that emotions, certain emotions are universal. But um, is that really the case? Um, just because somebody has the same facial expression and does the same behavior, um, is that the same emotion? It's not clear uh, that it is, actually. You could take an emic approach and, and say that uh, we don't know yet. We need to do phenomenological research. Actually, this would be a good dissertation project. 
Anyhow, um, <clears throat> and these early appraisal theories leave a lot of open questions. We still, they don't say anything about what emotion is, if it's physiological or cognitive. Um, they tend to place more emphasis on cognition, but, um, you know, these James, James Longa theory, Damasio, the whole field of affective neuroscience certainly suggests otherwise. And, um, they, uh, they don't, they don't, uh, necessarily take on, uh, these other approaches. These appraisal theories don't take on these other competing approaches to say where the other competing approaches fall short. Um, so what we're left with is we have a, you know, a bunch of different approaches and we don't know exactly, um, which is going to be most fruitful. So, uh, you know, we, we learn, we're going to learn these, some of these theories and then work on combining them so that, uh, as we move forward, we can uh, choose the ones that we like the best on the basis of, uh, what we perceive to be better explanatory power for the questions that we're asking. So, um, and then there's also that question of, can an emotion occur without awareness? Um, appraisal theories, uh, the, or particularly the early appraisal theories, seem to suggest that uh, emotions do always occur with awareness. But of course, uh, you know, later uh, conceptualizations of emotion, like Damasio, has suggest otherwise. You know, you can have emotions, but not all emotions uh, uh, produce feelings. And then uh, uh, Levant uh, from Harvard, he, who was here a couple years ago, I was on a panel with him about, um, about uh, normative male alexithymia, which is the idea that alexithymia, in fact, is a condition where uh, you don't know what feeling it is that you're feeling. You don't know what it is. You can't, can't tell. And uh, Levant's research has... Uh, suggested that uh, for many males, that's actually normal. It's normal for males not to know what they're feeling. All right. Uh, so now moving onward to the multi-level spars approach. Um, so just to, we're going to go more into it later, but here just to taste um, this uh, again, recapping that it is this uh, schematic, propositional, associative, and analogical representational systems. Now I don't even know which A is which. I like it better with the analogical as the first A, but I don't care which way you put it. <clears throat> the thing that to, to remember is that one of the A's is analogical and the other A is associative. Basically, just to recap what we've gone over before, an analogical representation system is uh, the mental representation system for sensory data. And you can think of like the sensory register and even any sensory data that is uh, um, stored in long-term memory, including image, in mental image images. Thinking about that Koslin and Pomerantz article and, uh, and the whole Koslin versus Polition debate. And uh, whereas the propositional representational system would be a system uh, by which propositional representations, or in other words, little chunks of information stored in memory that don't pertain to sense data, but do pertain to basic chunks, chunks of meaning. Um, so that's the propositional representation system. And then the schematic system would be higher order organizations of propositions and also possibly analogs. Uh, typically, we think of schemas as uh, being higher order organizations of propositions into interpretable goal-relevant mental models. Um, they're not always schemas, by the way, are not always goal-relevant, but uh, the schemas that are relevant to emotions, those tend to be goal-relevant because remember that a cognitive appraisal that leads to an emotion is always uh, assessing the current situation or the target situation in relation to uh, some schematic representation of a life goal for the person, either a momentary goal or a life goal, some sort of personally relevant goal. So um, in Power and Dog Leash, they talk about different systems that the analog, analogical representation, representations would all be organized into one system, the propositional representations in another system, the schemas into another system, etc. I'm not so clear on uh, why these would need to be distinct systems, but uh, maybe it's helpful for our understanding to think about them as separate. And I don't think we lose much if we do, but this could be another case 
where, uh, where uh, an utterance is exuberant. So they have said that, um, the, uh, that these are separate systems. In some way they've implied that they're separate systems and that could be an exuberance of the uh, utterance, which is uh, you know, causing us to almost overinterpret what's going on, possibly. And then there's the associative system, which is, uh, which is basically it contains analogs and propositions. In other words, analogical representations and propositional representations. And, um, and they are tied together with logical links. And uh, as activation spreads through the system, then uh, it, it yields uh, automatically elicited emotions. So you can see one uh, diagram uh, that looks like it describes the sparse approach pretty well. Take a look at that. So you can see that um, the only two pieces that feed into emotions are the schematic system, which is the appraisals, and the associative system, which is the um, automatic generation of emotion. And the analogs and the propositions, they feed, they are the backbone on which the, um, the uh, schematic system and the associative system work. And the only thing that I don't like about this particular drawing, now that I look at it, uh, I'm talking about it as I look at it, there should be an arrow from the analogical system to the associative system because the, there are obviously analogs. I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. There are obviously analogs in the associative system. Of course there are. So just think about that. An arrow going from like a two-headed arrow between uh, the analogical system and the associative system. So this is actually just a, again, for your reflection, um, it echoes what I said before. If all this is going on to produce an emotion, it seems like we would have a, a disjointed experience of emotion, and yet we experience an emotion as a whole. It's a, like a heterogeneously defined yet whole packet. So just keep that in mind um, as you go through. How might that be? I don't have an answer to that necessarily. Now, uh, here are the two pathways to the generation of emotion. Um, you see here um, that there's a route one and route two. Route one is uh, the appraisal-based route. It's more effortful, slower. And route two is the associative route. It's a little unfortunate here. Obviously, Power and Dalgleish, their route one basically is reminiscent of Kahneman's system two. I'm not saying, now don't over, maybe it's helpful actually that route one um, that it's not the other way around because it might lead us to erroneously draw too many comparisons between uh, Kahneman System 1 and System 2 and uh, Power and Dalgleish's Route 1 and Route 2. They're not necessarily the same thing, but I do want you to, to notice this thing that there is a, that there's a more effortful route and there's a less effortful route that's more automatic. And uh, you can see here that the event happens, it's time flowing from left to right. So the event happens earliest and then it gets represented uh, analogically. We know that from the first part of the term because what happens, it comes in through the uh, sense uh, sensation system, sensory system, and it gets represented in the sensory register. And then, uh, of course, attention happens and then as some of it passes through attention, some of it gets filtered out and uh, some, some of it lands in uh, working memory. And then from there, some of it goes into long-term memory. So we know that this is happening at the same time, but, um, but uh, in terms of just the generation of emotion, first there is an analog. So maybe the bear is uh, running towards me. And so the first thing is that I see the bear and I have the mental image of the bear and the noise of the bear and all those mental images that are um, represented analogically. That's the very first thing that happens. And then there is a low level interpretation of uh, those analogs. And you know, I create uh, propositions that are relevant like uh, bear 
you know, running towards me, this sort of thing. And then the, those propositions get organized at successively higher and higher levels of organization to form schemas. Like the bear is running at me and wants to eat me. The bear is chasing me and is going to eat me and kill me. You know, and so then when I have that scheme that the bear is chasing me and wants to eat me and kill me, then at that level I can compare that schema to uh, some other schema that I have in my long-term memory that describes a life, you know, a personally relevant goal. Like in this case, it might be staying alive. So I see that the schematic interpretation I have uh, generated uh, uh, on the basis of what's going on, that that doesn't, that is inhibitory towards my... Uh, personal goal. It's, it's, it's very relevant and, um, you know, but it's incongruent. It's relevant, but it's incongruent. In other words, the primary, the primary, uh, uh, appraisal there, it's, it has motivational relevance and motivational incongruence. So, um, so that's how I would think about relevance and congruence actually. And then, uh, yeah, and then there's probably other things going on too. Like uh, there's a large thing coming towards me quickly, making a lot of noise, um, and uh, you know there is an evolutionarily established uh, associative pathway to the generation of fear. So when something large is coming at you, whether it's a car or a um, bear you're going to get scared and run away. That has been evolutionarily adaptive. I don't even have to go through the appraisal process. So I probably, that's why James is saying, I, you know, I find myself running away and then I experience the emotion. So um, certainly the appraisal comes later than the association. And in this case, the associative pathway and the appraisal pathway would both take us in the direction of the same emotion. It's not always the case. Now, um, I just wanted to say again that uh, this idea that there is an associative pathway to the generation of emotion and a, an appraisal-based pathway to the generation of emotion, it seems to imply that the appraisal pathway doesn't work through association. So I just want to clarify that there is a connectionist neural net substratum underlying all of cognition, all emotional experience. I mean, basically... Like I've said before, in the head, it's all ones and zeros. At the bottom line, it's all ones and zeros. And so all thinking and all psychological experience relies on those ones and zeros. So uh, certainly, clearly, the associative pathway relies on ones and zeros. Certain nodes activated, other nodes not activated. Activation spreading through uh, nodes that are more closely linked to each other. But... Even the appraisal, which is a higher level thing that's going on, that also couldn't take place without all of those ones and zeros firing every few microseconds. So, um, so uh, don't be confused by Power and Dalglish's use of the word associative uh, as implying that there's no associative network underlying the appraisal pathway. It's just the very basic ones and zeros sort of thing. It underlies all psychological experience. Now, just to situate this whole thing within um, the context of the course, you know, think back to early Nicer when he talked about the architecture of mind, had those three components, structure, representation, and process. And that's essentially what we're seeing here, structure, representation, and process. Um, there is a structure, an organization of information into schemas. Uh, the content of the, that has, has to be personally relevant, goal relevant, self, world, and other. And then there's a certain process by which those appraisals are made. And the same thing for uh, Route 2. There's a structure of information uh, in long-term memory, uh, the logical links that are there. The nodes themselves are the representations. And the process is the spreading activation that takes you through uh, that pathway to the generation of emotion. And so that's essentially, SPARS is essentially an information processing model of emotion generation. It talks about structure, representation, and process. And so these, these uh, ideas that we saw earlier in the term, like uh, so in social cognition, where uh, there was distributed 
cognition or um, the extended mind or uh, activity theory where no cognition can be understood uh, in um, uh, extracted completely from its context. Uh, it doesn't make sense to extract cognition from the uh, context of the life goal in which it uh, is triggered. That those theories actually are, they're in some ways more radical. They're more radical than what we see in Power and Dalgleish. And remember when I was saying on an earlier slide that it, depending on where you circled, where would you circle where the emotion is? Remember it was, it was this one, where is it? Um, boy, it's way up there. Yeah, here. Uh, I said, where would you draw the circle around the emotion? And I, I gave as an example, you know, depends on your theoretical viewpoint. If you're an information processing person, then you would draw your circle, you know, you'd at least have the appraisal, physiological reactivity, and action potential circle within the circle. Um, if you you might extend it to interpretation, and you, I suppose you could extend it to behavior. It all depends on your preferences. But you probably wouldn't have the event in it. But definitely, if you are uh, an activity theorist thinking about emotion, you would have to draw the circle around the entire diagram here. Because uh, what happens inside the head would be uninterpretable without... Uh, contextualizing it in terms of its event, the, the life events and um, that the antecedent life events and the concomitant life events and then the behavior that's generated because uh, uh, no psychological experience is understandable um, in this illusory extraction from uh, its context. So anyway... <clears throat> I think I was here. Yeah, so in some ways, Hearst and the activity theorists are more radical than Power and Dalgleish. Just keep that in mind. But you can still take, remember, it's never about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's take what you can, see where it has explanatory power, and then keep working, keep refining your understanding. Um, and, and also, you get to uh, figure out what you like. What are your preferences? Um, what types of explanations do you like and why? So uh, next series of slides are going to take you through different uh, routes through, these, uh, through this model. <clears throat> so the first thing is, um, and I think I've talked about this already, but so the first thing that happens is there's an event outside. Damasio would call it an emotionally competent event. And then it gets represented analogically. I see the uh, bear running towards me and I form a mental image of the bear. And this is, goes in the sensory register, obviously, I say here, you know, reflect on this. Um, that's the first thing that happens. Um, so everything, the, the loud noises, the um, soft caresses, the, whatever it is, they all get represented analogically. Then, um, <clears throat> and then this Interpretation, remember the first thing that's going to happen is an interpretation. So, so uh, the situation has to be interpreted. So we have uh, the event um, being first represented analogically and then low level uh, translations of the analogical representations into um, basic small chunks of meaning, i.e. propositions, takes place. So you go the analog stimulate uh, the creation of propositions or the activation of relevant propositions, and then those propositions get organized into um, increasingly complex, higher order uh, organizations, um, and then we call them a schema. And the schemas are interpretable. And uh, not all schemas are goal relevant, but the ones that we're talking about here, they are goal relevant. Now, um, just to review, again, uh, an analog is a mental representation of sensory information. It's not independently, independently meaningful. So uh, careful with this because, uh, you know, an analogical representation of a soft caress, when I say that soft caress isn't independently meaningful, I mean that it doesn't have propositional meaning. It might have relevance. It might be important. 
So sometimes, sometimes when, um, here's something I just thought of, a lot of times in common parlance, we, um, we conflate the word meaningful with the word important. So uh, the analogical representation of the soft caress um, might not be meaningful in the sense of uh, a proposition, but it is definitely important. For sure, it's calming. You know, it could trigger, you know, a, you know, a, um, a de-escalation of a negative emotional experience, this sort of thing. So uh, then uh, propositions are, contrastingly, are mental representations of a basic meaning unit. So um, they are based on the processing of analogs. So you can't, the propositions are, are basically already there in your long-term memory and they just are activated according to whatever experience you're going through. Um, and the analogs themselves are what stimulates the activation of certain propositions. So first I have to see the bear, first the bear has to come at me, then I have to sense the bear and perceive and, uh, and create analogical representations. And then it's those analogical representations that allow me to uh, activate the relevant propositions. There is a bear, you know, these low level, you know, that bear is running, you know, the direction is towards me, those sorts of things. And then you can see how all those things, there is a bear, the bear is running, the direction is towards me, all those low level propositions, they get uh, combined together. And, um, and it becomes an interpretable mental representation uh, and personalized organization of this new information uh, combined with past experiences. So there, that's when, maybe that's when I realized that this big animal is actually a bear. So, um, so I figure out that's a hungry bear. <laughs> that's, I know that when bears run towards me, that's when they're hungry. So that now I know in my schema, at the level of propositions, I might not have known it was a hungry bear, but at schema, because I'm combining it with past information, I know, or I think I know, I've interpreted that that's a hungry bear running towards me who's going to run towards me until he gets me. Oh, I've known that it's then at that level, I know it's a grizzly bear, and I know that he's hungry, and I know that they don't give up until they eat tear you limb from limb. Or, I don't know, whatever it is. I could have learned wrong information or right information, but it's whatever is there in my long-term memory gets combined with the new information to form an interpretable schema. And obviously, um, it, it's active and evolving. So if the bear does something unexpected, if the bear, um, you know, uh, I don't know, starts doing like a choreographed circus dance, then I realize that it's a circus bear, you know, and it's not going to eat me, and I have to change my schema. Um, and, uh, and so this, how is it that this new information that's coming in actually interacts with the old information? The idea is that the propositions, the analogs, and the schemas, they stimulate searching and matching strategies where, um, you know, there's a, uh, some new analogical representation and it, there's a search and match strategy for similar analogical representations from uh, past uh, knowledge, either stuff I've read or um, stuff I've experienced. And, um, you know, when I find the analog that matches the old analog in my long-term memory that matches r close enough, the new analog, I found it through that search through the long-term memory and matching. And when that match is made, then it's like, yeah, I can, that's when I can identify that this big hairy animal running towards me is a, is a bear. So, and this happens on all levels. It happens, it happens at the levels of analogical representations, of propositional representations, and schematic representations. And the more this happens, say like I go out every day for uh, a year and every single day uh, a bear chases me. And, um, and so at that point, my, um, through the process of uh, mental plasticity, which is based on neurological plasticity, uh, there are structural changes actually that are brought on. So I start to get very familiar with all of the information relevant to bear and I start to expect bears to run after me and I would be surprised when I don't see a bear running after me, all this sort of thing.
So, and that this be, becomes actually encoded, um, not encoded, the better word would be um, built in. It's built in to uh, my information processing architecture. This uh, familiarity with bears, this expectancy of bears, um, simply because I've experienced it so often. So uh, to think about these different um, pathways to the generation of emotion within SPARS, you might use the metaphor high to low. And for this, um, we are indebted to George Lakoff, a very, very cool uh, linguist and philosopher. And actually, he does very interesting political commentary, too, if you're interested. But um, anyhow, he talks about um, you know this metaphor high versus low. And here we are looking at more complex uh, forms of organization as being higher and more useful in some ways uh, versus low. What's low would be uh, less complex and sometimes uh, sometimes less useful. So certainly between schemas and propositions, we can see that the schemas are more complex and the propositions are less complex. Schemas are high, propositions are low, um, and, and analogs would be even lower. They're, they're uh, um, less Perhaps, perhaps, it's sort of um, debatable because uh, Koslin might say that, um, certainly Politian would say that the analogical representation is slightly more complex than the propositional substratum that he, Politian, was saying underlies uh, the experience of mental images. But again, you know, there's people saying one thing or another, and so you get to uh, basically just... Um, think about it how you how you like in a way you know with reference to the literature but uh, schemas are high in complexity whereas propositions and analogs are lower and appraisal thereby use higher pathways of information processing more effort, effortful and time-consuming um, and you can ask yourself is that always the case whereas associative um, uh, system would use lower pathways of information processing. It's automatic, quicker, less complex. And again, you could ask yourself, is that always the case? But this is the, the idea. And then remember that SPARS is a, um, is a bringing together of uh, these different accounts of the generation of emotion. And, uh, and, and think back, you know, the, the other people, the people who like Lazarus, for example, and and uh, Lyons, uh, who did also did appraisal, and um, then look at like Mandler, for example, or or um, people who did the associative only theories of the generation of emotion. Each of those theorists thought that their theory uh, was sufficient to explain emotion. So now Parr and Douglas are saying no, neither appraisal by itself nor associative by itself is enough because both are happening and both uh, explain different kinds of emotional phenomena. So you get to critique that in your own mind. Uh, it might not be the case. Maybe Par and Dalgleish are missing something. Maybe there's a way in which associative uh, models actually are able to explain everything and that we don't need to rely on appraisal models uh, or vice versa. <clears throat> and you know, you can always, as we go through this, at what level does therapy work level or levels, does therapy work to change existing patterns of emotion generation? And it could be maybe different kinds of therapies work at different levels. This would be a very important thing for you to consider. What types of therapies aim to influence route one, i.e. the appraisal route? And what types of therapies aim to uh, influence route two, i.e. the associative route? Now, going back to that, um, you know, that, uh, that diagram that we saw before with the Route 1 and the Route 2 on it, um, I actually think I, I, um, I talked about this slide already, so you can see it now. But um, basically, if a bear is running towards you, your eyes and ears take it in, and then it's processed in perceptual areas of the brain, and then mental images and uh, which would include uh, include auditory analogs or olfactory analogs. Maybe you smell that bear. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know what bear smells like. You smell the bear smell, and then that um, that 
smell is represented as an olfactory analog in, within your information processing system. And so all these mental representations are analogical representations of the external event. Now, it, it's, these events are not always external, because remember in the Schachter and Singer experiment, there were injections of adrenaline, and that caused an internal event. And so the, there's an increase in autonomic arousal uh, from the injection of adrenaline. There's tachycardia and uh, shortness of breath, for example, and tightness in the belly. And those, you might actually consider those events to also be external in the sense that they're external to your representational system. They're things that you could notice. So even though they're inside your body, but you're noticing them just as much as you might notice, uh, you know, this big hairy thing running towards you, you might notice that you're short of breath. Um, so you could form a uh, mental image of uh, a, a proprioceptive analog, actually, you might call it a proprioceptive analog. Or if you get nauseous from the bear smell, you might, who knows, if you get nauseous from the bear smell, you might have a vestibular uh, analog that you um, have a, a mental analogical representation of that uh, feeling of being off balance uh, that you get from being nauseous from uh, the smell of the bear. Etc. So this question of this use of the word external is for your further reflection, um, but that's how I think of it. Now, uh, so then, and I've I've actually alluded to this before. I, I don't know um, how much more detail I need to go into, but so a low level chunk of meaning or various low level chunks of meaning are formed on the basis of the analogical representations. So it is translated, there's a basic interpretation of the analogical representation, or representations, more likely, into basic meaning units. So, um, so uh, the bear is running towards me, and there could be like very uh, sim uh, simplified notation. You can see um, in the Pyrandal Gleesh how they use this particular type of notation for propositions uh, versus schemas, etc., to indicate uh, a lower level of elaboration versus a higher level of elaboration in the schemas. You don't really need to worry about that unless you want to. But the idea is that um, it sort of looks like computer code running parentheses, bear, comma, me, ends parentheses. That makes it look very uh, uh, computer. And what is information processing uh, models are all based on the computer model. So that fits in. Now, uh, then this I've also talked about before that, you know, once you have a slew of relevant low level chunks of meanings represented as propositions, then those get uh, combined into a schematic representation. So uh, a more elaborate thing is that the bear is chasing me and wants to eat me. It's not just before it was the bear is running towards me, but here you've um, made it personally relevant. Maybe, you, like I said before, maybe it's a grizzly bear the grizzly bear is chasing me and wants to eat me. I've had to consult my long-term memory to identify what type of bear it is. I've had to um, personalize it, you know, according to my own view of self, world, and others, as you saw in that diagram of the various domains, goal-relevant domains, I uh, pardon dog leash. <clears throat> um, so you rely on uh, the, the uh, current propositional representations that have been formed on the basis of your analogical representations, i.e. the bear is running towards me, um, and then your pre-existing schemas. You know, you have a schema that bears, you've learned that bears are fearsome, man-eating predators, you've learned what a grizzly bear is, essentially the stuff in your long-term memory. And then you combine those elements with each other, and so again, you use those searching and matching strategies. Uh, looking, taking the new information and looking for anything in the long-term uh, store that is similar enough to it. So you do that by searching and matching and then you associate the new information in the propositions with the old information, which are schemas and probably propositions too, which are part of your pre-existing knowledge structures. And then uh, you come out with a new highly organized schema to represent what's going on. And uh, I've talked about this before that a schema is uh, is a more elaborate, elaborated and more personally relevant uh, than a proposition, and that this is conveyed in um, n differences in notation, 
So you can see here in Power Dog Leash, they do that uh, thing with the parentheses for the for the proposition, where the verb is on the outside of the parentheses and the subject and object are there in the parentheses, and the schema is uh, there's nothing outside of those um, brackets. Everything is uh, inside the bracket. Look at that. I've made my brackets wrong, but um, just um, ignore that one after the word cancer. So the schema here would be people who smoke cigarettes get lung cancer and die. Be the entire schema. Obviously, that relies on a lot of uh, subsidiary propositions. One of them might be that smoking causes cancer. Um, So here is, uh, on this slide, is the idea that a schema, okay, up until now, it's basically been that uh, schemas are organizations of propositional knowledge, both from the new situation and from long-term memory. But now I'm suggesting to you that uh, there could be a, um, a role for analogical representations in the generation of schemas. Um, Certainly, we've seen that analogical representations are necessary for the generation of propositional representations. But could there be um, a way in which an analog would be part of a schema? And would that change the way we think about schemas from, from before? So it's something for you to reflect on um, as you go forward. Now, um, I've talked about this before, but the appraisal pathway is computational. It seems like it's a serial processing model. Um, it's labor intensive. Um, it is mostly automatic. I've, I've said that it's uh, effortful. And then here I say it's mostly automatic. Most of it is automatized, but, um, but it somehow is more burdensome to your processing resources. It's it involves more complex comparisons than the, uh, um, associative pathway and um, centrally it is the comparison of the schematic representation of what's currently happening to other goal relevant schema in your long-term memory. And then uh, more on appraisal, the second slide on appraisal. Um, the uh, present situation is appraised in relationship to your goals and goals contain particular content again this is representation right the representation piece knowledge about yourself knowledge about others and knowledge about the world because you have to know what the constraints and the facilitating elements that are available to you might be and uh, <clears throat> So you have to construct a personally relevant functional context of meaning, a schema, complex system of information, um, which is composed of propositions um, and maybe analogs. And then um, there are, if you uh, like Par and Dog Leash, um, you can think of there being five appraisal scenarios. Again, it's possible to criticize this as being oversimplistic, overly simplistic, but they would say uh, that this is what the empirical literature demonstrates. Um, <clears throat> you could appraise the uh, current situation or the target situation because maybe you're not, maybe you're actually imagining a situation or something like that. So I'm going to say you could, we're going to talk about a target situation. You could appraise that target situation as um, being facilitative of a particular goal that you have. You do that, of course, by comparing your schema about the target situation to your personally relevant, goal-relevant schema and seeing if they match up or not. Um, so uh, you could appraise uh, the target situation as being facilitative uh, of a goal or um, and that would yield the emotional experience of happiness. You could appraise it as uh, being indicative of loss or failure in relation to a goal and that could cause sadness uh, or appraise the target situation as being a threat to a goal which would be associated with fear and uh, or you could appraise the target situation as uh, blocking a goal 
by a perceived agent. So this is a little different from fear, but when there's somebody, remember that, that accountability component of the uh, revised version of Lazarus's, uh, it was the 1993 model of, um, of, uh, sec of, of um, primary and secondary appraisal, where secondary appraisal was broken down into four components. One of the components was that accountability portion. So that would help differentiate a fear uh, scenario from an anger scenario. If you think that somebody is to blame, then um, it's possible that you would feel anger rather than fear. But it's hard to feel anger if you uh, don't have someone to blame. Again, you could blame the universe and be mad at the universe. And then there's disgust, which is when you think, I think this is the, one of the most interesting ones, um, when the target situation is appraised as contaminating a goal. Something has contaminated your goal. So uh, took a good thing and made it bad like uh, food that has gone rotten. Food is, food is relevant to uh, the goal of staying alive and staying healthy, fit. And uh, when it's bad, then it has been perverted in some way. Sex is a good thing. Uh, but if it is, um, you know, uh, somehow a paraphiliac sort of thing or, or whatever, uh, then it can be uh, too, it can have the sense of being contaminated and uh, could uh, generate disgust. Uh, any form of, of uh, pleasure, when you see somebody who's like, maybe even you recognize yourself if you're being very hedonistic, um, then uh, the situation that you're in has uh, taken a good thing, which is the experience of pleasure, and made it bad by uh, somehow overdoing it. So uh, it's the, you might get disgusted even with yourself, for example, for having been too hedonistic or with someone else. Uh, there's nothing wrong with pleasure per se, but perhaps there's a way in which we've judged an over, uh, an, an exaggerated, for example, an exaggerated uh, um, pursuit of pleasure as being disgusting, as contaminating, taking what's good about pleasure and turning the whole experience into something bad. Uh, same thing with vanity, this sort of thing. And then obviously there are cycles of appraisal. That's the thing to keep in mind. There's no um, real uh, ending. It keeps going. And um, as events change, life circumstances change, uh, long-term memory changes, um, then your appraisal keeps changing, but you keep appraising in cycles. And, um, and so there are always new interpretations, always new appraisals, and uh, that can change your emotional state because remember that appraisals generate emotional states and then you're in an emotional state. Uh, like Damasio would say that you're in a, an emotional packet has been activated and then that activated emotional packet exerts biasing effects. Um, you know, so it, it's generated by the previous, basically there's an emotional state here. I call it the previous emotional state, but in the future, it's going to bias future processing. So if you're in a happy mood, then new things that happen, you're going to appraise it with that happy bias. You're going to tend to see things through rose-colored glasses, etc. And you can think of this, again, as a supervenient biasing effect. That means there's a, a whole thing that you're experiencing, which is the wholeness of that emotion packet. And then that, and that whole thing has arisen from these component parts, these information processing parts, the appraisal, the I mean, the generation of the schema, the uh, appraisal that is done based on the schema, and then the action readiness and the physio physiological response, etc. That's all experience as a whole thing that has emerged out of parts, but then superveniently it biases future um, processing. So that these low-level processes, the generation of propositions from analogs, the, um, certainly your attentional processes, definitely the organization of propositions and potentially analogs into schemas, that those are all um, biased by whatever emotion packet is uh, currently in effect. So that's how, incidentally, how emotional states can escalate. Um, you can see how if this goes awry, that that would lead to mania for example, or depressive rumination on the other end. You can, you can play with this idea of supervenient biasing to see how, um, you know, how moods are maintained or when uh, it gets out of control that actually moods escalate 
out of proportion to the situation. Now, that was all uh, route one, the appraisal pathway. So now we have a couple of slides, a few slides on the associative pathway. I'm going to take a drink of water. <clears throat> so sometimes appraisal isn't always occurring in a clear-cut way at the time of the emotion. For example, um, you know, people who get disgusted by flan, um, they might get disgusted automatically by the texture of the flan. There are certain people who don't like flan. I love flan, but anyway, um, so some people get disgusted by flan because of the texture. Um, and the appraisal, which is that um, of, that would lead to disgust, would be that this um, is, uh, has contaminated my goal of nourishing myself because it's taken the, the nourishment and, um, and made it bad, took a good thing and made it bad. That would be the appraisal that would lead to disgust, right? But, um, but that's clearly not happening. Um, there's nothing inherently anti-nourishing about flan, maybe sugary, but you know, that's not so bad. But uh, the fact is that there is a much more automatic, low level, more primitive uh, type of processing that's happening that whereby that texture is triggering the uh, experience of disgust. So, and this is on a more, it's in a more automatic way. So um, I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of examples now, but I want to call your attention to uh, page 151 in Power and Del Gleish, where uh, there are two different examples of um, Peter and Julie. So Peter's fear and uh, Julie's fear, there's no current threat at all. Um, uh, there's uh, the fear of birds and then uh, the situation with the, the father, I believe. But anyway, um, look at those descriptions of fear being generated um, outside of the appraisal process. And these are things where, you know, you could just explain to somebody, you know, if you're somebody's friend, say like, oh, there's nothing to be afraid. These birds have nothing, there's nothing to be afraid of about these birds. Um, but the person wouldn't be able to hear that because the fear is actually being generated through a more primitive, uh, more automatic pathway. And so look also on page 156 in Parnado Gleesh for three pathways. <clears throat> and uh, remember that for this associative network to generate emotion, it does that through spreading activation. So all of those basic properties of spreading activation that we've talked about at various points throughout the course apply. Uh, there are um, concepts are organized in long-term memory um, by way of logical links and meaning is created through the logical links, particularly through their activation. And the links are plastic, so that the more that they get, more frequently they get activated, the stronger they become. Some links are stronger than others, and then that their strength depends on how frequently they're activated. And activation spreads throughout the system following a fanning effect. We heard about uh, Anderson's fanning effect, where, um, where it's like ripples in a pond. The, the um, activation is strongest when there are fewer, um, it's like an irrigation system, uh, essentially. So if the, basically, uh, the, the fewer links there are from one node, <coughs> the stronger the activation is that, uh, when it spreads from that node. And the further it gets away, like ripples on a pond, the, um, the more it sort of fades out. And remember that uh, spreading activation can happen within a symbolic network or a connectionist network. Here in Power and Dark Leash, we're, we're talking about a symbolic network of nodes, um, propositions uh, that contain meaning uh, and that are uh, where meaning is localized, even though a connectionist substratum is understood to underlie all uh, mental processes, those ones and zeros. So, um, essentially, this uh, slide is um, mentioning, again, what I, what I talked about before, that there, um, in these uh, 
associative networks, it's not just propositions, it's propositions and analogs all interacting together, all linked together. Um, and uh, in, in with the analogs, there are proprioceptive analogs. So that means my image, sense modality image of my shortness of breath or my sense modality image of my own fast heart rate or whatever it is. So it's not just what's happening on the outside, but it is also uh, what's happening on the inside. And then how do these uh, automatized um, generation of emotion, how do they, how does this happen? How does this get established? Basically uh, through repeated pairing of event emotion sequences. So, um, you know, for example, your, your, um, oh yeah, here's a good one. Um, so say, uh, yeah, you could say something like, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, my father usually uh, slaps me <laughs> when I smart off. So when your father comes by, you might uh, appraise that situation as, as uh, at being at risk for getting slapped because maybe you're smart off all the time. <laughs> so, um, uh, so you, uh, appro you, um, oh no, okay. So sorry. You, uh, your father, you smart off and, uh, then your father smacks you. And so you've appraised that situation as, um, as, uh, being afraid of your father smacking you. Um, and, uh, so when your father comes by, um, you, and you learn that essentially your father, the, the smack hurts and, um, you know, and there's either fear or anger or both through that appraisal process. But, um, but as that, uh, situation gets repeated over time, uh, it gets to the point where just the presence of your father is fearful. So, um, and maybe your father then does therapy later in life and becomes a much more subdued, mellow, loving guy. And, um, still you find yourself for some time with difficulty, uh, letting go of some of those old reflexes of maybe avoiding your father or, um, or flinching when your father comes by or whatever, whatever it is. So this sort of thing would be an example of a repeated event emotion sequence, whether it be fear or anger um, in this particular case, but actually it could be any emotion. So there's a repeated pairing of the event and the emotion and that after time it becomes automatized. And um, there are other examples you can think of as well. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, you, um, say you're a person who has panic attacks and, um, you have had many panic attacks throughout your life and you know that how they start is with heart palpitations. So, um, you've learned through this event and emotion. So you have, you notice the heart palpitation and then you experience the uh, panic attack, the extreme fear. And this is repeated over and over again. And um, so then later on, you take up running, maybe because you heard that exercise is good to lower stress and that lower stress is associated with lower panic attacks. So as part of your therapy, your therapist rem uh, recommends that you go running. So you head off running and uh, sure enough, you start having a fast heart rate maybe a fast, maybe you have heart palpitations or just tachycardic. And um, because of how many times in the past you have had heart palpitations followed by a panic attack, uh, that fast heart rate from the running then just automatically triggers a panic attack. Um, even though you might be appraising the situation as completely benign, in fact, there's nothing scary about it, you're doing something healthy for yourself. So, but the uh, fear, emo the emotion of fear has already been triggered uh, simply uh, through that associative pathway, that route to 
And you, you can imagine, you can see how this would be an analogical representation of the tachycardia that <clears throat> would trigger the emotion of fear. It's not logical. It's not part of an appraisal. It's happening automatically and quickly. And in fact, you know, the person might need to stop and uh, calm him or herself down and talk himself down. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of here. I, I, um, uh, my heart is beating because I'm exercising. You know, there's nothing to be afraid of. The person, so and then, then in that way, the person could impact the appraise, the emotional experience. Maybe could be impacted um, through uh, trying to impact the appraisal, because the uh, route to generation of emotion is already that's already going. And then I just wanted to mention that uh, this pairing can happen in an individual's past. Um, again, referring to Peter and Julie on that page 151, um, where uh, in because of pairings between event and emotion in an individual's past, um, or maybe in the guy who has the panic attack in the past, or the uh, fear of the father, any of these examples, these are in the individual's past. Um, and due to that repeated pairing uh, of event and emotion, there is an automatizing of the appraisal process by which later you don't even need to do the appraisal process because it's all automatized. And that's, again, why would this happen? It's to preserve processing resources. It's just uh, similar to practice effects. Things become automatic. We always try to conserve uh, processing resources wherever possible without even being aware that we're doing it. But it can be in the individual's past or it can even be in the evolutionary past. There are genetically hardwired predispositions. So this example that I gave of flan, it, uh, to somebody who loves flan like me, it might seem strange, but um, there, it's, there's actually a genetically hardwired predisposition to avoid um, custardy textures uh, because uh, custardy textures are reminiscent of uh, rotting food, actually. Rotting, when food rots, it gets, it deteriorates and gets jelly-like. And um, it's, it was, uh, it's, and still is, it is, has been evolutionarily adaptive uh, for organisms to avoid eating rotten food, the food that has a lot of bacteria in it. So um, it, there's a hardwired predisposition uh, in many people to avoid custardy textures. Um, or bitter taste is another one. Most uh, venoms and poisons are bitter. So we have a strong, out of the four different, there's sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, or umami, whatever. There's, there's five tastes available in our, um, in our uh, tasting apparatus, and gustatory apparatus. And, uh, and bitter is the taste that is most aversive to most people. I mean, I like sour and I like salty. I like all tastes, but bitter is a, more aversive to me. Ugh. Bitter can even be disgusting, to tell you the truth, um, because a bitter food might be a food that's been poisoned, or um, a bitter salad might be a salad that somebody accidentally put um, poison leaves inside, something that wasn't healthy for you. And so evol evolutionarily... Um, you might uh, have a hardwired predisposition to be disgusted by a bitter taste or fear. Um, I'm not quite sure why uh, the text of these slides isn't coming out all the way, but um, snakes in cages are fearsome to uh, some people, even though you know they're in the cage because uh, snakes have been so dangerous over the course of our evolutionary history that as a species... Uh, our, an our ancestors, the ones who were able to avoid snakes more effectively, those are the ancestors that tended to survive. So snakes are, exert a very powerful, genetically hardwired fear response. Um, maybe even spiders also, even when they're inside of glass cages for some people. So that appraisal, which is that the situation isn't dangerous because the snake is in the cage, doesn't even... It's not relevant. I mean, and for some people, you'll see the uh, fear reaction first, followed by uh, 
the appraisal reaction, which is that in spite of the fact that the snake is dangerous, it's not dangerous now because it's in a cage. Um, you'll see that succession of emotions, but some people will be inconsolable because they won't be able to get past the fact that that's a snake and there's that hardwired uh, predisposition towards fear. And this can all be thought of as uh, going through the um, associative pathway to the generation of emotion. So, um, <clears throat> Again, just a recap, Route 1 is the uh, effortful, um, schematic-based uh, appraisal. Remember, it's not effortful in the normal sense. It's just more burdensome, more taxing to the information processing system because uh, even when it happens fully outside of conscious awareness, it still is involving higher-level organizations, more complex organizations of uh, information than the associative level. But schematic... Uh, appraisals, they are sometimes, you're sometimes aware that you're making them and sometimes you're not. And you might be able to, uh, here's a hint to a previous question, but you might actually uh, go through, um, you know, uh, therapy, uh, either cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive therapy or, um, or uh, dynamic ther therapy, expressive dynamic therapy to look at what are the schemas that um, are, that I'm making most relevant um, and using to guide my uh, reactions to current situations. <clears throat> so now the last uh, little bit of this, we talked about Route 1 and Route 2, talked about basis of emotion, then Route 1, Route 2, and uh, now we're going to talk about this order to disorder question. It's another really great strength of SPARS is that it ties in um, the uh, emotional experience and shows that how it's the same processes that underlie ordered experiences of emotion uh, that also underlie disordered experiences of emotion. Now remember that disordered experiences of emotion are not necessarily pathological. Pathological um, is uh, is when it's, you know, it, it would have to be consistent, it would have to be um, uh, causing social or occupational dysfunction. It would have to, essentially, we'd have to meet Jerome Wakefield's criterion of harmful dysfunction, which is the um, central nosological criterion underlying the way the DSM is written, DS, all the DSMs, including DSM-5. <clears throat> so um, disordered, though, you know, for example, like uh, somebody could, you could lose your temper and it could be momentarily maladaptive, but if it's just a one-time thing, then you can't say that the person, uh, that there's pathology there where the person has, an, you know, some sort of anger-related dis mood disorder, like either an irritable bipolar disorder or maybe a, um, a personality disorder where there is uh, affective uh, dysregulation uh, with problems with anger, like for example, borderline, etc. For those sorts of conditions to be diagnosed, obviously a host of other criteria would need to be met. So disorder is a more primitive, more elemental type of characterization of emotion that is experienced that is not attuned to the current situation and not doesn't lead to adaptive uh, behavior. But again, it can just happen, uh, you know, one time only. Um, and wouldn't necessarily be considered pathological. <clears throat> so, um, so uh, essentially, these basic features of information processing, uh, you know, particularly within a spreading activation network, uh, you know, this uh, f this uh, concept of inhibition or facilitation, um, that these processes are usually adaptive and they lead to helpful experiences of emotion, but they can become rigid and in the case of rigidity can lead to maladaptive or disordered experiences of emotion. So for example, um, you know, within a spreading activation network, uh, it's good that one node might facilitate uh, the, ac the activation of one node might facilitate the activation of a logically related node because that helps us understand the world. It helps us organize our interpretation um, of uh, what's going on so we can actually understand what's going on. Um, and likewise with inhibition, um, you know, it's uh, helpful that uh, the, you know, that a happy, uh, 
uh, moment, a soft caress, helps us inhibit the uh, previously active experience of sadness. That's good. Um, but sometimes uh, inhibition and facilitation become rigid. And that is when they uh, lead uh, emotion to be disordered rather than ordered. So um, the two main processes here are inhibition and facilitation. And, um, you know, they are general cognitive processes, general information processes. They um, describe relationships between all manner of cognitive or cognitive affective phenomena, between emotions where, you know, the new happy mood inhibits the um, old sad mood or um, maybe the uh, new... Um, you know, fearful uh, appraisal about um, about one thing actually uh, facilitates the uh, fearful appraisal about a different thing that's also going on simultaneously to result in uh, you know even an even more intense experience of fear. So facilitation or inhibition between emotions, um, also facilitation or inhibition between schemas. Um, you know, one schema gets active, it inhibits the other schema. Um, you know, for example, um, like a schema for an addict, for example, a schema about getting high and whatever it is like. So the person might think, if you've ever worked with an addict, maybe there's a schema about, um, about uh, if I get high, I feel free. Um, and then there's a competing schema, which is uh, when I stay sober, I... Um, have a rewarding life, and so the 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 um, at the moment of uh, relapse, that schema of uh, if I get high, I feel free. It inhibits the other schema, which is uh, if I stay sober, I have a rewarding life. Uh, so this this could be an inhibitory thing there, um, and then also uh, inhibition and facilitation between goals. That this is actually maybe. Um, can also this same example that I just gave about the addict can also be seen uh, between uh, the goals. Which is which is goal is most important for you? Is it uh, to stay uh, to have a rewarding life, or is it to feel free? And so uh, there might be a trade-off between those goals, and uh, it might just be that um, they inhibit each other. So one gets active, it inhibits the other one. If something the other one gets active, maybe because of the presence of a trigger in the environment. You see somebody picking up. Now you hear that your friend picks up, and so then that triggers you to activate that uh, goal of feeling free. He's feeling free. I want to feel free too. So then that goal gets activated, and it inhibits the other goal of um, of uh, having a rewarding life. So you can see that. Inhibition and facilitation, they work at all levels. I talked on the other slide, I talked about how um, nodes, the links between nodes might be either inhibitory or facilitatory. facilitatory. <clears throat> but um, it, you can see that they happen between any manner of cognitive psychological phenomena. And you can also see that they can either be adaptive or maladaptive. And so as with anything in psychology, these processes are adaptive when they're flexible and attuned. And hence, they lead to ordered, helpful experiences of emotion, experiences of emotion that are helpful in decision-making, uh, as you've seen in Damasio, etc. And when they are rigid, uh, that's when they're maladaptive and lead to disordered experiences of emotion. Um, that's basically it. And that's basically with anything in psychology. So um, both of these uh, processes, inhibition and facilitation, rely on a um, conceptualization of mind as being essentially modular in structure. So when I say modular, I mean composed of modules, like different uh, semi-independent uh, modules all running at the same time, like uh, your iPhone with a whole bunch of different apps running at the same time. The apps influence might influence each other, but um, they're also running semi-independently. So the guy who came up with this notion of modularity of mind is Jerry Fodor, a very important uh, mind to know about. And um, Marcel Kinsborn, uh, whom we touched on briefly, I believe, in Study of Amnesic Memory, um, uh, also told me once that the mind is at once uh, 
gloriously integrated and exquisitely differentiated. And uh, it's this idea of uh, semi-independent programs running at the same time and uh, that they may be uh, competing for salience. So think about when you're looking at Windows or your Mac or whatever, and you, um, you have a whole bunch of applications going, but you click on one and you're working within one. So there's one that is active and that dominates your experience of the system at the time. And it might even dominate uh, the working of the other uh, applications that are also going at the same time, or it might uh, dominate or impact in some way the uh, overall system settings. So uh, I mentioned uh, supervenience before. That's how when um, you know something becomes salient, it influences the constituent parts and and, and the rest of the system. So so basically, um, you know, maybe it's like um, I don't know some sort of uh, setting on something like a um, uh, recently on my calendar I changed a setting for time zone support on you can toggle that on or off and basically what it is if you're traveling back and forth between time zones then one toggle one whether when it's on it does it one way and when it's off it does it another way but basically it's how does the calendar deal with um, when you make an appointment for a different time zone and then you switch time zones and how how does the calendar represent that so it's basically like um, when the calendar is up uh, and you can toggle on and off then that um, actually the settings on that um, on that superveniently influence uh, constituent parts of the system I don't know how helpful that example was um, but essentially um, it's the the main thing to keep in mind is that there can be lots of uh, applications running at any given time and uh, usually there's one or just a couple that are um, that you're actually working in and that those are the ones that are salient and uh, you can think of the other programs as competing for salience. And so uh, the idea of modularity, Fodor's modularity, um, as applied to emotion would be that emotions act like modules. There could be a fear module, a sadness module, a happiness module, that sort of thing. And so you might have a, a couple different potential emotional reactions to the same situation and they might be competing for salience. It's not that they have goals, agendas of their own, each one wanting to be the one to reach salience, but more that um, that uh, uh, they're somehow going to be one that uh, reaches salience or two maybe. So a salient, an emotion becomes salient, it's generated by spars goes through rep one or two, and then superveniently in a top-down way biases the function of the cognitive apparatus itself. And um, you know, for example, you you um, a sad mood is generated um, through the appraisal of a new event, which is that uh, the puppy dog has been lost, and a, it's uh, indicative of the loss of a goal. Maybe your goal was a happy family life. And then um, the text that's not seen on this is that the um, that then that sad mood makes it um, hard to appreciate new good things that happen. So if there are different modules, then there can be interaction between the modules, and that's where inhibition and facilitation come in. And um, <clears throat> there are two different types of inhibition. There's passive inhibition and active inhibition. The uh, one with more empirical support is passive inhibition. That's where the strengthening of one module results in its relatively greater influence over the entire system compared to other competing emotion modules. So it's a simply, simply just inhibiting the competing modules simply by strengthening the uh, target module. So it gets stronger and stronger. The target module, the one that has reached salience or is reaching salience, gets stronger and stronger. And thereby, because it's getting so much stronger relative to the competing modules, then we can say that there is passive inhibition happening whereby the uh, strengthened module is passively inhibiting the other 
modules which haven't been strengthened in the same way. So it's not directly inhibiting, that's why it's not actively inhibiting those, it's just getting stronger itself, and so we can say that it's passively inhibiting, passively inhibiting the others. Whereas actively inhibiting is more controversial, it hasn't been received a lot of empirical support yet, but that would be like where there's a direct inhibitory effect of one module on other competing modules. That would be like um, if, uh, actually active inhibition is, it is um, intuitive, that would be like getting happy pushes the sadness out sort of thing. It makes the sadness weaker, but it just doesn't have a lot of empirical support yet. So that's inhibition, and you can see how inhibition could be adaptive a lot of the time. But you can also see, uh, you can probably think of uh, examples where inhibition between emotion modules could be maladaptive, and you can also see your book for examples of that. So uh, one example um, of an emotional problem that it, that can come out of um, inhibition, maladaptive inhibition, would be alexithymia, which is not knowing what emotion you're experiencing. So uh, the dominant module could inhibit your awareness of other competing, uh, but nonetheless important emotions. So um, say, actually, uh, um, uh, here's a really good one. Um, that uh, you're angry at your lover for cheating on you, um, and the anger is the uh, dominant emotion, and it has inhibited the salient, the potential salience of the sadness that uh, you're feeling underneath. And so um, where the healing needs to happen is healing that sadness, looking at what came up for you um, about the, um, this feeling of loss and working with that. And that's where, you know, um, that's where the person that cheated on you, that's where that person, you know, could make amends is, is working with your sadness um, if even possible. And that's also where you could learn and grow yourself is working with your own sadness. The anger is maybe what's most dominant. And depending on how much of an inhibitory, passive inhibitory effect it has had on the sadness, it, it might impair your awareness of the sadness completely. And uh, all of the important information that uh, an experience of sadness at that moment would convey to you about yourself and um, your hopes for yourself and your life. So here are a few examples of inhibition. Um, <clears throat> talked about the first one already, talked about the second one, um, talked about the third one, you know, a desire competing goals, desire to be socially accepted versus desire to express self. You can see how those would be both be nice goals to have. There's nothing pathological about either of them, but you can see how they might inhibit each other. Um, and then also inhibition at the level of the cogn cognitive architecture, which is what I started out talking about, which is the inhibitory connections between nodes. Now, so we talked about inhibition. On the other end, we have facilitation. That's when one type of cognitive phenomenon strengthens other cognitive, related cognitive uh, facilitation. Uh, cognitive phenomena. So it's similar to inhibition because it's the way two modules would relate to each other, but in fact it's the opposite. It's where inhi inhibition is inhibition, facilitation, facilitation. It's obvious, but basically it can happen in all the same ways that inhibition happens. It can happen at the level of the cognitive architecture between the nodes. It can happen between similar, similar schemas, and it can also happen between emotion modules and um, just like inhibition, it, you know, it invokes that notion of spreading activation and priming. So uh, here, priming, you know, so because facilitation is a type of, in a way, priming, you, you make it easier for the other module to get activated or the other node to get activated at whatever level you're talking about the facilitation. <clears throat> so um, facilitation is absolutely essential for information processing because, um, because it's essential for spreading activation to work. 
Incidentally, so is inhibition. You couldn't have spreading activation or information processing without both inhibition and facilitation. Um, and it leads to problems when it's inappropriate, and uh, that is particularly true in the case of coupling. So um, coupling is a uh, particular maladaptive type of uh, facilitation where it's a reciprocally facilitative link between you know two let's say two or maybe you could maybe think of an example where you know where there would be more than two modules but let's say it's a reciprocally reciprocally facilitative link between two modules and it usually results from repetition or trauma it has uh it is characteristically rigid if it weren't rigid if it were flexible it wouldn't be coupling it wouldn't be maladaptive so um so let's think about two emotions which might be seemingly contradictory, um, which get where through repetition of that event emotion pairing, uh, through the process of mental and neural plasticity, long term potentiation, cause the experience of disordered pairings of emotions. Okay, so there's a couple examples in the book. Have a look at page 166, the examples of Anna and Ed. So Anna, you will see in that little vignette, is uh, sad about things she missed out on because of all her fear. So she missed out on a bunch of stuff because she was afraid. And then she's sad about those things that she missed out on um, because of her fear. And that then causes fear about missing out on more in the future, which incites sadness, again, about everything that was lost or maybe anticipatory sadness about a life uh, where all of those opportunities would be lost. So this is a coupling of sadness and fear uh, that locks her into a um, very disordered, in this case it seems, you know, it does seem pathological, it seems that she's going through something, you, you might be able to specify a diagnosis if you knew more about her, um, but uh, this is a definitely disordered uh, experience of coupling between sadness and fear. And then uh, Ed, in an even like more twisted way, in some way, unfortunately, from Anna, Ed is happy about the things in the past, which incites sadness because they were all in the past, which makes him think more about the past, which was happy, which incites that same sadness again. It ca catches him in like an infinite regress where he's locked in that and he can't really make any real progress. He can't get on. You can see how this would be stasis. He's caught in the past um, and unable to get out of it and unable to live his life uh, productively and adaptively now. So both of those cases are they're different variants of, of coupling. But you can see how this coupling is a special variant of facilitation where it's rigid and it can either involve uh, contradictory emotions like uh, in the case of Ed or uh, more similar emotions like in, in the case of Anna, but in either case it's maladaptive because it keeps the person locked in a cycle where they're not reacting to their, they're not living their life now, essentially. Another example, uh, one that I came up with was this uh, Schadenfreude, uh, the coupling of Schadenfreude and guilt. Schadenfreude is a is like a uh, form of contempt in a way. Uh, <clears throat> no, Schadenfreude. Let's see. Uh, Schadenfreude is when you are basically happy about uh, uh, it's basically it's basically like a happiness it's like a perverse sort of delight um, it might be as strong as delight it might be muted but it's delight that you have at you know somebody else's expense so particularly somebody that you like so one of your you're happy you're sort of smugly happy when your friend got a lower grade on the test than you for example. So that's called schadenfreude. So it's a type of happiness, actually. It's a type of happiness with a particular target. So <clears throat> it's a coupling between happiness and guilt in this example. Um, and, uh, you know, and just to note here that uh, contempt for, as we go through this slide, I want you to bear in mind that contempt can be a form of uh, disgust. So, or a pairing of, of anger and disgust. Contempt is sort of like a pairing of anger and disgust. So first you have um, contempt for the other. They did worse than you on the test. And then that produces delight 
in yourself. This is like a classic narcissistic defense. And then this combination produces more disgust or contempt, this time directed against yourself because you notice yourself doing this and that's not the kind of person that you want to be. So um, you get contemptuous at yourself, right? And then uh, disgust itself, that obviously this contempt at the self reactivates that disgust module. Um, so, so you're locked in this disgust um, thing and then... Actually, like, I think actually something even more complex is going on here because if you are disgusted with yourself, then it means almost that you've divided yourself into two parts. There's the part of you that you're disgusted with, and then there's the other part of you that is noticing how bad that uh, schadenfreude was and then feels contemptuous towards that part and, and thereby establish itself as a... Uh, um, superior. So then there's delight, there's this coupling between the delight and the disgust anger. And it's just an ad infinitum sort of uh, thing where it is, uh, uh, you can't get out of it. You might not be able to get out of it unless you either have help or maybe you have a lot of um, motivation and uh, desire to uh, to introspect and learn and, you know, do better, um, try to uncouple this uh, schadenfreude, which is the uh, happiness and then the guilt slash uh, disgust, sort of like a happiness and disgust coupling is what I would call that. Coupling of happiness and disgust, the case of schadenfreude. But you can see how this would really keep a person locked in because you keep getting uh, contemptuous of one thing or another. You're contemptuous of the other person, uh, which makes you happy, which then makes you contemptuous of yourself. But in that, you've split yourself in two, um, which means that you're not all bad, so that you can sort of identify with the part of you that is contemptuous of the schadenfreude part of you. And then that makes you happy. But then that uh, causes disgust, causes guilt. It just keeps you locked in. So um, these examples of coupling, I think, are very interesting, and you can think of any number of examples. Um, they are what make clinical work so uh, tricky. It's so hard to unravel these um, experiences of uh, emotion because they're locked in, uh, and they motivate. Each part motivates the other part. It's facilitatory. The... Um, the particular brand of schadenfreude-like delight facilitates a disgust module, which facilitates in a twisted way a happiness or delight module, which then goes back and facilitates the disgust until something different is done.